So we're delighted yet again to be able to be with you, Caroline. And uh, let's pray, shall we, before we begin, just to get our minds and our hearts in gear. Let's pray. Once more, Lord, we thank you for um, the gift of art and artistic expression, uh, for the beauty of um, the painting down the ages and the way in which it expresses something of your uh, creative um, uh, power and uh, also something of your kingdom. And we ask uh, this evening, Lord, that you'd uh, speak to us in a new way and open our minds and our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Caroline. Right. Well, this evening we're going to be looking at one of the most beautiful paintings, it's been called the most beautiful painting in the National Gallery. And can we start, please, um, Andy, with the first image? And it is the Wilton Diptych. More Christmas cards have been made of the angels and the Wilton Diptych than I can possibly imagine and count. But what is this diptych? Well, somebody has called it a traveling kingdom of heaven. It's hinged, it's wonderful panel painting, hinged a bit like a book. I've, actually, I've got um, the sort of size of the book, I'm holding it, I don't know if you can see it, holding it in my hand just here. It, it, it's quite big to hold, but it's something that is easy to prop up on a flat surface and really to think about. It was painted undoubtedly for King Richard II. There he is kneeling on the ground in the left-hand panel. And he is being presented by his three patron saints. Talk about them, who they are in a minute. And he is gazing at heaven. Heaven filled with angels, filled with a lovely painting of the Virgin Mary holding a very beautiful, beaming, very personable little baby who is raising his right hand to Richard II in blessing. We have the date of this painting. It's, it's painted in egg tempera on, do, on oak. We don't know who painted it. It could have been painted in France. It could have been painted in the Netherlands. It could even have been painted in London. We simply don't know. But it must have been a very great comfort to him. I was opening it, just looking at this about two hours ago, and I thought, what would it have been like to be Richard II looking at this, gazing at these wonderful two panels hinged in the middle, so it acted like a book. And the date is very significant, 1396, because his first wife, Anne of Bohemia, who he absolutely adored and who was very wise with him. And she had just died two years earlier. And he, things were getting very difficult at home with Bolingbroke, with Parliament. And he had just married for the second time Isabella of France, the daughter of the King of France. And we're going to be looking in a minute rather closely at um, the way his magnificent fur lined cloak is embroidered and what he's wearing, the collar on his neck and the little badge as well. We're going to look at that in a moment and see how and why it dates this absolutely marvellous painting. Looking at the saints who are presenting him to his heavenly host. On the left-hand side, we have St. Edmund, king and martyr, who was killed in 869 by the Danes in East Anglia. That's why he's, he's holding his emblem, he's holding an arrow. And some of you may know Bury St. Edmunds in, in Suffolk in East Anglia, and Bury St. Edmunds is absolutely where he's buried. And they're the most marvellous, monastic ruins there. You can go through the old gardens and there you have something which really speaks about the way these Danes flooded into the country. They were very pagan. The king refused to give up his faith and he was actually patron saint of England until we have the crusaders of bringing 
George and his dragon um, galloping into the country and taking over from this rather more modest Anglo-Saxon saint. On the right hand side, immediately behind Richard II, we have John the Baptist. And in the middle, Saint Edward the Confessor. We're going to be doing a bit more on Edward the Confessor in a minute in a close up, but he's very, very, very important to Richard II because when he died in January 1066, he was buried in Westminster Abbey. And over the next 100 years, miracles started happening at his tomb and he was made a saint about a hundred years after he died. Also, and this is very important, is that he died in January 1066. Um, there was a sort of um, a muddle and it ended up with Edward the Confessor coming to England in October and he was crowned standing on the tomb of Edward the Confessor on Christmas Day 1066 and Westminster Abbey has been the coronation church of the kings and queens of our nation ever since that Christmas Day 1066. It tells you something I think about this marvellous saint's staying power. On the other side, on the right hand side, you have this glorious kingdom of heaven. Just looking at what we have here, right at the top, we have this banner, this um, beautiful rippling banner, and it's got a red cross on it with, with a very, very long tail. And that is a flag representing Christ's resurrection, and um, also taken on board by St. George, of course, as well. And I just want to talk a bit about this color, this wonderful color, because the color was known, still is today, in Italy, as ultramarine. Why is it called ultramarine? Because the pigment needed to create this wonderful depth of blue actually is lapis lazuli. Mm. In those days, in the Middle Ages, there was only one known source of lapis lazuli, and that was a group of mines in Afghanistan. So by the time it came from Af Afghanistan and came across the seas, ultramarine across the seas to Venice, which was the center of pigments at this time, it was very, very expensive. In fact, it was more expensive even than gold. And there's a lot of gold um, on this diptych, as you can see. So when you look at that and you see the Virgin Mary and these marvelous, there were 11 angels here and, and the figure of her baby, you can see that everything has been chosen enormously carefully. And this tells us that Richard II himself would have been very, very involved with every detail on this diptych. And there would have been a contract in those days, you, you would go to the artist studio, although in, in those days they were much more like sort of artisans, very high class craftsmen. And every detail would be written out. It was a legal document, including the amount of gold and the lapis as well, and the depth in, with which it was used. And you had to pay up front for lapis and gold, very expensive. And you can see that Richard's heavenly family, are that they're, they're, they are based in a meadow strewn with flowers. The little blue flowers are violets, which are symbols of humility. And there are those rather sort of puffy, pale things, are actually roses. And I discovered something wonderful about roses when I researched this. Ambrose of Milan, the great Bishop of Milan, who um, at whose feet um, St. Augustine sat, Ambrose of Milan decided that roses symbolized <laughs> the fall of man and his redemption. Why? Because before they fell, before they ate the fatal apple in the Garden of Eden, roses bloomed, scented wonderfully, and they had no thorns. After the fall, they had thorns. So you get this exquisite beauty, the scent of paradise, but the thorn of this world. And you may sometimes have heard of Mary being described as the rose 
without a thorn because she is entirely exempt from suffering the consequences of fall in her soul. So lots of very, very careful symbolism going on here. Just going back to Richard II kneeling on the ground. If you look behind the three, his three sponsors, his three saintly sponsors, you can see a forest. Well, forests were places of danger. Wild animals and um, wild men lurked in forests. So this is the world. And it certainly was the world as Richard II was to find it because in 1399, his cousin Henry Bolingbroke seized the throne, put him in prison, and he starved to death. He died in, in 1440 in Pontefract Castle. Which is why, looking at this, I thought immediately, whilst he was still king, this must have been the most extraordinary consolation and comfort to him. Could we have the next slide, please, Andy? Right, we're going in close now to see Richard looking up opposite. And there we have the, the, the baby Jesus with his right hand raised in blessing. And what he's doing here, the, what's going on here, is that he is bestowing in blessing the right righteous sovereignty on the king of being the king. And of course, in, in those days in the Middle Ages, the king was seen as, as God's agent on earth. Now, looking more closely at that wonderful collar that he's wearing with these um, double pods of the seeds of the broom plant, you see, when you look actually at the painting itself in the National Gallery, you see those little white dots. Well, they represent pearls. And underneath, you can see the big badge of the white, of the white heart, which was long before Richard married for the second time in 1396. Um, that was his badge. And badges, particularly in his society, were by no means did everyone um, read or write. Badges told people about your allegiances. And so we here, we have on the right hand side, do you see the angels? The angels are wearing the livery of Richard II. And look too at the gold in the background. You can just see the gleaming of the gold. And you see a pattern in the gold on the walls behind on either side. And this is stippled or punched so that it has this ripple surface which would catch the light and imagine praying in front of this and the candles catching the light and making this sort of movement across the surface of the gold at the back. And on Richard's side of the panel, you can see it's a tiny little pattern. They look like um, buds from, uh, from, 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 from branches. But again, this movement and the halo of the Virgin has a radiance. Do you see it, it's been um, struck into, it's been scribed into, so it has this sort of flickering radiance and very difficult to see here. You really need the um, to go close up in the National Gallery. But in Christ's halo is stamped a crown of thorns, a twisted chain of the crown of thorns. There are also nails in there as well. And that is prefiguring, of course, what is going to happen to this child. And the navel is very, very important because it means that he is both fully human and fully divine. And you can see much more close up. You can see here with Richard II. Do you see John the Baptist behind him? Just a bit of John the Baptist carrying the lamb because of course he came um, saying behold the lamb of God when he first sees Christ before the baptism. Um, I think our artist has had great fun being very literal here. Again, we make sure that John the Baptist is also um, fully, fully flesh, fully human. We've got his navel in there as well. And I was reading the authorized version, which is absolutely splendid on what John the Baptist was wearing. And the authorized version says that he was clothed with camel's hair with a girdle of skin 
about his loins. Well, if you look very carefully um, in the National Gallery, you can see that that sort of tie over the string belt that he's got around his waist actually is a leg of a camel with a camel's pad. And if you look just below his knee, you can see actually the head of the camel as well. So he's gotten the whole thing to wear in the desert. I'm sure it kept him very cosy. Um, next slide, please. Some context, very, very important. None of these marvelous artworks are produced in a vacuum. And Richard II's court was exceptionally literary. And the great literary star at his court was Geoffrey Chaucer. And there's this very, very famous painting. Um, it, it, it's a page from a manuscript, which is in the Parker Library in Corpus Christi College in Cambridge, which, which holds, has tremendous holdings of um, medieval manuscripts and a lot of church documents as well. This page, which was painted about 20 years after Richard II died, it shows Chaucer reading the Canterbury Tales at the court of Richard II. And there in the close up, you can see Chaucer, he's in a sort of pulpit with a red cloth thrown over the front of it. So you, you can't miss Chaucer. And there just below Chaucer is a man with a, with a, with a splendid hat on. It, it gleams gold when you um, see it in, in the reel. Now we don't know if that was the man who um, paid for the book or if it was the king listening. As, it's not, as he's not got a crown on, it's probably the man who paid for the book. And I was talking to the um, librarian just yesterday about this marvelous picture. He sent it to me. And he said that it's almost certainly the man who paid for the manuscript. And the manuscript is incomplete. There are, all the writing has been done and there are places for more pictures to be dropped in, but they didn't happen. And he said, probably the, the, the man who ordered it, he might have died, he might have run out of money. These were very uncertain times in England, but marvelously it was um, scooped up by Parker, Queen Elizabeth I, um, Archbishop of Canterbury. It was scooped up by his chaplain and it became part of this absolutely marvellous library in Corpus College in Cambridge. So you can see this is a very sophisticated, very colourful court. And Chaucer himself was actually a diplomat, a civil servant at the court of Richard II. He'd started his career as a diplomat with Edward III, Richard II's grandfather, who he inherited the throne from. And we know that Chaucer went to Italy. We know that he was in Florence. We know that he was very keen on Dante's Divine Comedy. And Dante, who's about 50 years earlier than Chaucer, had actually written in the, the, the Divine Comedy in, in the um, language of everyday Italy. And of course, it's Chaucer who, with his marvellous stories and the Canterbury Tales, which I think probably every school in England still studies in English, it was written in the English tongue of everyone. And it's from this point on that we get English being used as the language of the court. And Stephen talked about that in the very first Advent um, presentation he gave us two weeks ago. It's very interesting, this is a very literary movement and very important and fascinating ideas are coming into the country from Italy and someone like Chaucer who travels widely is very interested in this and he takes these ideas with him back to the court. So this is what is going on at the same time. And what, what is fascinating, you see all this luxury, but actually it, it's very important to remember that with Richard II in the Wilton Diptych, it's not a vanity piece. The Wilton Diptych actually is a piece which is devotional. And of course, it's important for the king to be a fountainhead of culture and beauty. And 
things like jewelry, painters, artists, architects, um, people who weave tapestries, they all are encouraged by the king and the court and they're, they're part of the prestige of the national life. Next slide, please. Now, back to Edward the Confessor. I just want to tell you a little bit about the story of the ring. Edward the Confessor, who came to the throne in 1044 and died in January 1066, who um, was a cousin of William the Conqueror, and he'd sort of promised his throne to him, but um, it didn't happen as quickly as William the Conqueror would have liked. Now there's a story about this very, very devout king, that he was out one day on his way to consecrate a new church. A beggar, a very hungry beggar, came up to him asking for alms, and the king had nothing to give him except his royal ring, which was set with a large blue sapphire. So he gave it to the beggar and went on his way. A little while later, there were two pilgrims in the Holy Land. They were from London and they were approached by a quite sprightly beggar who came up to them, handed them the sapphire ring and said, I came in disguise as a beggar. I'm actually St. John the Evangelist and your king gave me this ring. I want you to take it back to him in London and tell him that he'll soon be with me in paradise. So they came back, gave the king the ring, and the king dies. Well, he dies in January 1066. Miracles happen at his tomb. He's also the spot, beginning to be the spot for coronations. He is made a saint just about a hundred years later. And as he's being made a saint and his coffin is what's called translated into a new shrine, not this one, this shrine, which you can see on the right-hand side is an older, is a, is a later one. And the monks at Westminster Abbey, curious, said, let's have a look. The saints don't decay like the rest of us. So they looked in the coffin. He looked pretty good. And on his hand was a sapphire ring. They took the ring off his hand, put it into the crown jewels, which in those days were kept in a chapel in Westminster Abbey. Later, when Henry III was rebuilding the abbey in honour of Edward the Confessor. He began in 1245. He had the shrine that you see here made for Edward the Confessor. He also called his son, King Edward I, and the blue stone was set into a crown. This shrine, which we should see here, is where Early on, when H and his family from America as well came, we did a wonderful tour of the Abbey because I now work as a volunteer in the Abbey. And it was marvellous because we had H with us. He read prayers for us in the shrine. There was a lovely prayer card there. It was just us and his family. And we all knelt. Do you see those little niches that you see on the bottom? That's where the pilgrims would come and they would kneel there and pray to St. Edward the Confessor, because I'm, I'm not getting into arguments with saints here. I know some of you don't approve of them, but <laughs> the fact is saints are a very, very well established part of the Christian faith, going right back um, to the first Christian martyr, Polycarp in the second century. And because saints are filled with the Holy Spirit, and when they die, even though their bodies decay, they are still alive with our Lord in heaven. And to have something to do with the saint, not only reminds you of them and of their virtues, but because they are alive in heaven, you can use them as an intermediary. Now, of course, all that goes um, with, with um, Luther for very good reason as well, it had become very corrupt. But there it is, and they still have even song every day when we're allowed in the cathedral, um, in the abbey, they have even song at the shrine and in the morning they have morning prayers and people go up and are let in. So it's, it, it, it is 
really one of the holiest places, certainly the holiest place in London, one of the holiest places actually in Christendom. And what is rather remarkable is that the body of Edward the Confessor is still in his shrine. What happened was, of course, at the dissolution of the monasteries, um, when Henry had all the shrines destroyed, the monks could see it coming. The abbey was one of the last abbeys um, to, to, to be taken apart by Henry, and the monks took the body of Edward the Confessor and they buried it in the precincts. Then when Henry dies, of course, Edward VI comes to the throne and he's very, very Protestant. And then we have Mary Tudor. And while she's on the throne, um, 1553 to 1558, she turns the country Catholic again. And thanks to her, she has that upper part, which has the sort of golden arches, it's very dark green, upper part built. And in the lower level of the upper part is where the coffin is that contains the body of Saint Edward the Confessor. Simple coffin. Now when James II comes to the throne, and of course he becomes openly Catholic, he decides, he looks into this Tudor superstructure and he has huge bolts of metal strapped round the coffin so that you simply can't get at it anymore. You'd have to dismantle the whole shrine. Well, that's not going to happen. And I was told this by the librarian who gave me a wonderful picture for this. We're going to see it next. That two years ago, when they were doing a great deal of work in the shrine, they took off the top level. And there, he said it was, was the most extraordinary moment. They saw the coffin of Edward the Confessor and saw these great metal bars that had been strapped round it by James II. So it is the most remarkable and wonderful survival. And when you go to the Abbey, and I go quite a lot, you really, it has such a feeling and it is really the holy heart of Westminster Abbey. And because it is our coronation church and has been, since 1066, which tells you something about our, the continuity of our history in this country. It, it really is one of the holy places of Christendom. And amazingly, up to the Reformation, it was a, one of Europe's great pilgrim churches. And pilgrims would come through hundreds of thousands of pilgrims. And of course, they brought a tremendous amount of money to the Abbey. One of the reasons is there's so many um, memorials in the Abbey is that um, it was discovered after the Reformation when they needed money um, that these great families would love to pay to have their families buried there and so that's why it's also a kind of national Valhalla. Next slide please. Ah oh, this arrived this morning terribly excited I mean trying to get this for about four days and ringing my lovely friend at the Abbey he sent us this marvellous picture of Rowan Williams with the Pope, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. There was a wonderful service in the Abbey and they went, just a few, went behind the high altar in the Abbey into the shrine and there they prayed after Evensong. And you can see that the shrine, you see with the golden arches, they're on the right hand side. Incense, they do, they do incense at the Abbey, but incense which reminds us, incense, because it not only smells wonderful, but since antiquity, long before pre-Christian, incense was always burnt um, in temples. And it is certainly in, in the Christian church, the incense, and you see this wonderful smoke and it smells beautiful, it represents, it symbolizes the souls and the prayers of the faithful rising to heaven. So it is an astonishing thing to see. And I hope it emphasizes how much the Abbey really is a very, very holy place. And there's a lovely video you can look up online about this. And it's, 
here at the shrine, this is the first papal visit actually since the Reformation to the Abbey. And listening to what Rowan Williams said, that this confirms us, Catholic Church, the Anglican Communion with the Pope. This confirms us, he says, in love for Jesus Christ and the enduring power of the Gospels. And the Pope said, we are all one in Christ Jesus. And it reminds us that the central book of our faith, I think the Bible, is full of history. But it's also full of wonderful insight, in particular the Psalms and the Old Testament, uh, I'm sorry, in the New Testament, which tell us about ourselves, which the Holy Spirit will use to help lead us and guide us as we grope our way in the Christian faith. And that wonderful, the, the little phrase at the top, the wisdom of the past, I took from a prayer I discovered in my research, um, a prayer of Lancelot Andrews, who is one of these, these great literary giants of the early years of the 1600s, along with people like um, the poet Herbert and John Donne. And he talks about, in his prayer, he talks about the wisdom of the past. And this is his prayer. Thank you, Lord, for my mind. And for those who can see into your mind, for my innermost self and my ability to praise you, for my freedom and the wisdom of the past, which helps me choose well. And there is so much wisdom and so much that is utterly contemporary now that happens in the Abbey as you go around. It's also full of the wonderful frailties of our human nature, but it's also full of evidence of the love of God for his creation. And then finally, the last slide, please. We have <laughs> the back of the Wilton Diptych. Thank God for the back of the Wilton Diptych. You can see it's much more worn than the front because you close it up like a book. And it's because of this that the inside, the beautiful, beautiful double panels of the Wilton Diptych have survived. Now, on the back, and you can go round the back in, in the National Gallery, we have this tremendous enduring symbol of the White Heart. Precious, precious symbol, attribute of Richard II. And do you see what holds the white heart? There is a crown, the collar about his neck, and there is a golden chain. And on the other side, um, you've got the, the coat of arms of Richard II, and it's the arms of England quartered with, halved with the, the, the martlets and the cross, which are the arms of Edward the Confessor. And when you go to the Abbey, you see that motif over and over again. And those little birds in the cross, martlets, are birds which fly very, very high in the sky. So they symbolize the soul. They never even come and rest. They, they mate in the sky. They live on little, little buzzy things which fly about the skies. So they are symbols of the soul and of heaven. And I've asked Andy if he would read something from John's gospel because when we looked at that actually Andy could we go back just sorry this is cheating a bit just go back to the very beginning now yep it, yes yes we'll get there just give me a minute yes because I want to just talk about this blue this fabulous blue blue well it's the most expensive pigment in, 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 in a painter's workshop. But blue is the colour of heaven. It is also the colour of truth, because when clouds come in the sky, 
and cloud the blue of the sky, when they depart, we see the truth of heaven. And this, of course, has become over the centuries the colour of the Virgin Mary, who gives birth to this child who, as a man, says to Pilate, I have come into the world to testify to the truth. I can't think of anything better to think about for Advent, but Andy, if you will read those verses from John's Gospel on chapter 18, please. So Jesus with Pilate, uh, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. Thank you, Andy. That's the end. <laughs> well, yeah, I could go on, but I won't, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> Caroline, thank you um, for that amazing sort of um, journey. Yeah, we're all clapping. We're incredibly appreciative. And the research that you've done and the, 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 the trouble you took to get some of those images. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, because actually, you know, I love all that stuff. Mm. Fortunately, I have a lovely cleaning lady who cleans my house and is quite Protestant. And we go through this. She comes on Thursdays. So I went through this with her this morning. <laughs> Fantastic. A lot. Well, let's open it up for reactions and comments, remarks. Do unmute yourself if you'd like to uh, contribute and just say something or perhaps some questions that we have uh, to, for Caroline. Caroline, how about uh, suggesting to the vicar we have uh, some nice incense burnt uh, <laughs> on, on oh. Sunday evening? Don't you think that would be rather splendid? Well, yes, I do. I personally am not talking about incense. And my grandfather, who was an Anglican priest with distinct Anglo-Catholic tendencies, very much so. He loved incense and he said that the great churches, um, which in the 1950s and 60s were plagued with Death Watch Beetle, he said, ah, ah, he said, incense drives out the Death Watch Beetle. That's, <laughs> that's, um, that's why they have Death Watch Beetle because they're not using their incense. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's a kind of, you know, a program well, by the Almighty. I, I, I note the suggestion, Michael. Uh, <laughs> What you don't know is that behind behind me, I have um, here uh, frankincense. Oh, wow. Ah. Mm. And uh, I keep that and it, uh, you just rub it and it's just the most extraordinary um, smell. And it is exactly the smell that you get in Orthodox churches. Yes. It's that incredible incense smell that just takes you elsewhere. So uh, it's also very expensive. Yes. Um, so I'm not letting anyone have it, but... Um, <laughs> Why don't we have some incense? Yes, I'm not against it. <laughs> <laughs> this is all being recorded, so you know maybe it'll come back. To... <laughs> we'll see. We can, it, you can visit the, uh, um, and see in the National Gallery, the actual painting, can we, um, Carol? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it, it's absolutely, it, it's, it's in the first room you get to in the Sainsbury Wing. But something I would suggest, I'm rather um, astonished, if you just Google Wilton Dittick National Gallery, now, it never used to be like that, you get wonderful, very sharp images, you can't download them, but you could go in very, very close. And you actually, if you go very close, you can see things you can't even see when you're looking at the diptych because it's behind glass. And one of the things which I found absolutely really had me laughing was this, in, was this whole thing of John the Baptist wearing a complete camel skin. And by his, by his left knee, you could see the head, the nose and the ears of the camel. Mm. 
and I, you know, and this made me realize how carefully this wonderful devotional object was discussed and put together by whichever workshop made it for Richard II. And just why is it called the Wilton Diptych? Well, it, during the sort of the Tudors, it vanished and it vanished and it ended up at Wilton Abbey, um, which is the home of the Herbert family who were very, very successful in, the, they managed to survive um, Henry VIII, the dissolution of the monasteries, Elizabeth I, and they became very, they were a family very, very loyal to the monarchy through the Civil War, everything. And the Wilton Diptych was actually found somewhere at Wilton, Ab Wilton Abbey in about um, 1720, and it was there. Nobody thought too much about it. And then in 1929, um, the, the owners of the Abbey, and we're now on the 18th um, Earl of Pembroke, they needed money after the First World War. And this was one of about six paintings known as the Paramount Paintings, which if they ever came up for sale, they should not leave the country. And it was bought for the nation. And so what is so amazing is that it's kind of been through one line ever since Richard II. And my hunch is because the Herberts were very, very loyal to the monarchy and uh, is that it somehow became a gift to them. And it just kind of bit got lost through time and was found again. So that's why it's in the National Gallery. Caroline, it hadn't struck me before but um, here you've got Mary and the baby Jesus in heaven, as opposed to on earth, surrounded yeah. by angels. Is that unusual? Is that unusual? Leslie, I don't know. I've got brain fog. I'm so sorry. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> I'm trying to think. The answer is, I don't know, which I think makes it, I mean, I really love this piece now, makes it extraordinary and makes you realise how personally the whole scheme of it was drawn up and chosen. I mean, belly button on John the Baptist, come on, you know, the, 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 the nose and ears, the face of the camel down one side, the fact that all the angels have got the badge of the white heart. They've also got rather less refined collars of broom cods, you know, by the time this gets to Richard II, his first wife's died. Parliament is kind of antsy. He's got trouble with his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke. And he's married again. He's just married for the second time. And rather amazingly, because we are in the middle of the Hundred Years' War and we're fighting the French, he actually marries the daughter of the King of France, which is rather astonishing. And I think this is a sort of moment of release for him. This is a moment of consolation. It's a very consoling piece to sit down and look at. And because I couldn't transfer this to Andy electronically this afternoon, I had to get in my car and go down with it on, on a memory stick. And I thought, mm, I'm just going to sit in front of this for half an hour. And what does it say to me? And it says, oh, thank God. This is very consoling and very peaceful. And I want to say my prayers in front of it. And I want to thank God that all's right in his heaven and all's right with the world, even though there's that rather sinister forest behind me, the king, and those, but I've got those three saints on my side. So it's it, it's an extraordinary piece. And I, I just love it that, you know, Lancelot Andrews has, say, has said, the wisdom of the past, which helps me choose well. You know, we're looking at, this extraordinary legacy of prayer and devotion, which somehow seems to be able to reinterpret itself in truth through the generations. And that's the extraordinary thing about truth. It is immutable, but each generation interprets it according to the changes in that generation and the understanding. Sorry, that's rather a long answer, but you should expect that from me, Leslie. <laughs> Does that make sense? It doesn't. Don't worry. I can't hear what you're saying. Yes, of course it does, Caroline. I was teasing you. 
Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> I love the way, Caroline, you, you repositioned the whole painting as a as an, a work of piety. Oh, yes. Because we forget that when we see it in a museum today, don't we? I think you need to sit with it for a long time mm. to realise that it's not just kind of, oh, excuse me, out of my way, I'm the king and I've got loads of money. It, it's not like that. It's a king creating this wonderful thing. And because it closes up like a book and it would have gone in, in, in a bag and it would have gone in its own treasure chest and it would have gone around the country or wherever the king was traveling to. That's why I think this amazing description of it is so apt, a traveling kingdom of heaven. It's very unlike anything else. It was private. It was made for private devotion. Very, very few people would have seen it except Richard and his closest entourage. It's very devotional. And it's like that woman in America makes her students sit in front of a painting for, for, for half an hour. Well, I've sat in front of that now for about 10 hours, probably. Yeah. And it has enormous power. It has enormous power. You can't look at it, even when you've driven back through the rush hour after delivering your memory stick to St. Barnabas this afternoon at 5.30. It just was so calming. And I thought, I must sit in front of this and say, what does it do? What's it for? Where's it from? I think it's wonderful that it's in the National Gallery because it can be shared by everyone. Well, thank you, Caroline. You've given us a lot to ponder on. And that's probably the aim of it, isn't it? Just to take time to reflect. Well, um, I hope so. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I like the fact that we can actually go online and look at it as well. And we don't even necessarily have to go to the National Gallery, which of course is not open at the moment, but, but we can look at it online. The online image is incredible because you can move through the entire painting and see things, um, see th extraordinary things, which you miss actually, because you, you, know, you get very close to it and it's much bigger than it is in real life. Yes, enough. Thank you. I'm going to go and have some supper now. Well, just before, we, <laughs> just before you, you leave us to go and have your supper, um, Caroline, we're going to pray just to conclude. And I'm going to use a, a prayer of uh, Lancelot Andrews. Oh, good. Since you quoted him, the bishop um, from the um, 17th century, wasn't he? Early 17th century, yeah. yes. Love him. Um, which is a prayer for the end of the day. So let's just pray this, shall we, together? Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend myself, my spirit, soul, and body. Thou didst make and didst redeem them. And together with me, all my friends and all that belongs to me. Thou hast vouchsafed them uh, to me, Lord, in thy goodness. Guard my lying down and my rising up from henceforth and forever. Let me remember thee on my bed and search out my spirit. Let me wake up and be present with thee. Let me lay down in peace and take my rest. For it is thou, Lord, only that makest me dwell in safety. So thank you, Lord, for another illuminating um, session and we ask that you would uh, remain with us uh, for the rest of this evening and this week and as we look uh, towards Christmas uh, we pray that you would uh, uh, be close to us um, Emmanuel God with us thank you uh, for that uh, extraordinary reminder today of uh, the way that uh, we can look to you and be renewed amen 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 thank you so much I feel so blessed well, thank you. So do I, actually. Exhausting the oh. rest. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 thank you, Andy. Okay. Have a good evening, everyone. Yeah. Bye.